Uh, yeah, so um, so today I'm going to present transform memory as a differentiable search index. So um, basically, this this paper is uh, if you search this exact same title, you'll find the paper on archive. So uh, I welcome anybody to follow along the paper as I give this presentation. Um, so so uh, some background. So uh, information retrieval and search have been you know primarily based on uh, learning scores uh, between uh, document and query pairs, and then ranking them. So given a query, you rank all the documents and then you sort them and then that's how you form the rank list, the output um, of a ranking model. So um, in this case, uh, there's a class of models known as dual encoders. Uh, they are well-established uh, state of art. So if you look at the diagram, uh, you can imagine you have two sentences. Uh, they are query and document and then you pass them through a transformer encoder um, that, that, that is most likely pre-trained and then um, you generate embedding and then you do a nearest neighbor lookup, um, and then you find the, the, the nearest neighbor, and then that's basically your, your uh, output for the ranking model. So this has been you know, the, the main uh, um, backbone of information retrieval models uh, in the recent years. So uh, yeah, so to, to dive deeper into this uh, class of models, right? So the, the first thing that dual encoders do is that they project document and query into low dimensional space, and then you compute similarity. So these, these type of models are usually trained with contrastive learning, and then they use uh, some kind, they, they can use some uh, self-supervision signal to, to train these models. And then uh, MIPS, which is maximum inner product search, is then used to find nearest neighbor. Um, so one thing about uh, nearest neighbor search is that it's discrete, right? So it cannot be learned end to end. Um, and then, uh, so, so you usually have to, to spin up some nearest uh, neighbor search server, and then you have to, uh, find a nearest embedding. So this is basically a pipeline of what standard information retrieval models do these days. So the other question is that you often see in papers like people do query and document cross intention. Um, so this is typically used to refine the, 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 the ranking list and it's typically used in re-rankers. So, so there's a class of models that are also called re-rankers. And then the, the reason is because uh, re-rankers are, are more expensive and then they use cross attention. Uh, so you, in, in uh, you know, in, in a real setting where latency is a concern, um, there might be issues with uh, computing the, the, the cross attention between every query and document pair. So this is typically expensive. So do encoders that, you know, encode document and query separately are, are kind of pref are preferred here uh, because you can cache all the documents, you can pre-compute all the document embeddings and then you can cache them. So uh, so basically this, this is the key idea of do encoders. So this, this um, this paper asks quite an ambitious question and it's quite a like a you know almost absurd question is that like so generally you have a dual encoder system and then you generate embeddings and then you do nearest neighbor search and then uh you you come up with the, the result set so it's a pipeline process and then sometimes there's a re-ranker at the end uh and then this process is is, is multi-stage right so uh this paper asks the question of whether we could parameterize uh, a search system uh, with just a single transformer model. So you have a query that comes in and then instead of passing through uh, uh, document encoders, query encoders, and then doing nearest neighbor search, like we just want to directly pr produce the result set with a transformer. So there's no more complex retrieval system. And then you just use a, a large transformer model to replace the entire complex retrieval system. Uh, a caveat though that this is still very early academic work. And, uh, and, and this is basically uh, you know, a proof of concept that this type of architecture works. So this this uh, this problem formulation has actually a lot a lot a lot of problems, right? So uh, a big question here is that why hasn't been done this done before, right? Because this this seems uh, I mean, in retrospect this this seems you know pretty obvious, but like the the, the main reason is because this is actually extremely hard. Um, and then the, the other question is that how can we frame retrieval as generation, right? Because uh, you know, there's a problem. Can we decode entire documents? And then, uh, how how do you efficiently, uh, you know, generate documents? If you want to frame retrieval instead of a matching problem, uh, to a retrieval problem, uh, how 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 do we go about it? Right. So this is there, there are quite a lot of technical challenge uh, that, that we have to overcome in order to, to get this to work. The next thing is that how can we train this? Right. So uh, in this paper, the premise is basically a differentiable search index. We want uh, a method to you know index the corpus into the model. Uh, so the question is that how can we train this, right? So how can we index documents and how can we retrieve 
uh, a, a dam from the model. So the main idea is that you have one transformer, you index all the documents within this, um, this model parameters, and then you retrieve them uh, uh, from the model parameters later. So this is drastically different from uh, any IR model uh, that, that's around uh, uh, so far. And then uh, the final question is that, like, you know, are we just going to do a single model? Right? Do we need ensembles? Do we, like, you know, is there's a lot of questions that come in place here. How large of a model do we need? Do we need a few billion parameters? Uh, are we okay with a base model? So I think there's quite a lot of questions here that, that we also, uh, you know, uh, seek to, 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 to kind of investigate in this, in this research paper. So, yeah. I mean, this is more of a, a, a you know extra reasons why we want to do this is uh, you know uh, additional motivation. So um, the, there there are some caveats with existing retrieval paradigms, right? So ranking is a very cumbersome problem because you train with like point wise or pair wise loss, but during inference you have to you know score all the QA pairs, and then inference is always different from training, and then this makes like if if anybody has worked on like running evals for IR tasks, like you generally find that IR eval is painful because you usually just can't get like accuracy because accuracy is not meaningful. You have to compute MRR and, 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 and NDCG and stuff like that. And then usually your eval is a, is a separate uh, process uh, because you have to score all the paths and then there's, the infrastructurally is a bit more troublesome. Um, and then the next thing is that like retrieval systems uh, that require on fast neighbor, uh, neighbor's neighbor search, they, they, they are non-discrete. So, uh, you always have this, um, uh, you know, spin up this fast factor search uh, server to compute the fast nearest neighbors. And then, uh, so there's always this uh, non, uh, uh, it's okay, so, sorry, this is, means this, uh, discrete component, not non-discrete component, it's a typo. Uh, so you always have this like external component that is non-end to end that you always have to, you know, take care of. And then this kind of goes, against the paradigm of unified models. If you like, you know, like models like T5, unified QA, they want to, you know, uh, use one model for everything. Like along this paradigm, it's always good to have stuff that is, you know, completely end-to-end -end differentiable. So uh, if you have a discrete component somewhere, it, it makes life a little bit less elegant. So uh, yeah, so this is an extra motivation of why we, we embark on this, this work. So I present uh, differentiable search index. So, uh, this is the first proof of, proof of concept towards like the next generation uh, information retrieval models. is uh, is 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 at, at this current stage is is a proof of concept. It's uh, very early stage, and and uh, we're still doing more research on this. But it's some early signs of life. Very hard to keep your dog with a mask. Okay, so um, DSI or differentiable search index, right? So the key idea is that we use uh, transformer and quality decoder to parameterize a uh, retrieval system. So all information about the corpus um, is stored in the model. Um, and then we introduce an indexing task to allow DSI to ingest documents. And then um, all aspects of retrieval like, are, are now mapped to well-known ML problems. So um, indexing is now in a special case of model training and, and gradient updates. So everything that is now uh, you know, nicely mapped into like a machine learning perspective. And then we introduce um, another retrieval task to retrieve from the transformer parameters. So we index and retrieving is considered like we are trained in, in the form of like multitask learning. They are co-trained. And for those who are familiar with like the T5 style co-training, uh, so DSI is maybe, uh, you know, follows quite a lot of the T5 paradigm where we include like a task prefix in front of the, the task to tell the model, is it doing indexing or is it doing uh, retrieval? So this is the main gist of DSI. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of core tasks. Uh, I, mean, I already spoke about it in the last slide, but the first thing is that there's an indexing uh, task and documents come in. So documents have tokens and then we, we learn a model that the model learns to memorize to, uh, to associate the, the document tokens to the document ID. So we, we try to bind associate the document tokens with the document ID. So this is what we call indexing. And then retrieval is you pass a query to the model with query tokens, and then you predict the doc ID uh, that, that you know, associated with the correct document. So 
in this type of setup, like you can imagine for retrieval, you have query and document pairs. And then for indexing, you have document and then the document ID pair. So it's just a sick to sick problem. Uh, and then it's indexing task and retrieval task. And then this is distinguished um, with a prompt token. So uh, is this, you know, it's like T5 style. You, you just prepend prefix saying that this is uh, retrieval or this is indexing. Um, and then uh, the model figures that out on its own. Then the, the question arises now is that like what are what are dot IDs, right? Uh, and then we, we also study like how to represent the dot IDs because we find that they, they are quite they, they actually affect the performance uh, quite a bit. And it's also quite an interesting research question uh, here. So dot IDs. So the dot IDs um, is kind of the target space of the DSI model. So you uh, you know you you if you assign uh, more semantically structured IDs, the model uh, kind of will have an easier time because of the NFT bias. So, but the first two uh, dog IDs that we investigate is the first is the naive string dog ID, right? So, we just assign random dog IDs to documents. So, like document 198384 to random document, and then we, uh, we let the model memorize this. Uh, the model just tries its best to memorize this. And then this is just treated as a string, and then it's tokenized with the, the default uh, sentence piece tokenizer. So, the model learns to generate this with BIM search. Uh, so it's not exact. I mean, this is actually quite absurd because the, the document IDs don't mean anything. They're just random numbers, right? So it's very similar to how, uh, you know, vocabulary is handled in NLP, uh, where, you know, there's no meaning to how you assign ID to a certain uh, uh, subword. So, uh, so yeah, so the, the first method we try is naive string IDs and, and we actually find that this actually worked uh, reasonably well it's actually quite an absurd idea but okay it works well so this is also another interesting finding of this paper and then the second thing that we investigate is actually atomic dog ids uh so the meaning of atomic is basically we, we, we consider the dog id to be an entire token so we reserve special tokens for these other uh, uh, atomic dog ids so we construct additional document embedding metrics with a predefined budget right so if you have 300k docs you create a matrix of 300k documents this is just like a word vocabulary uh it's just like a word vocabulary layer. There's not, nothing very special here. The only thing here is like, uh, it adds cost, right? Because you add parameters to your model. And then if you are using a, a model that's already pre-trained your, your document embedding matrix, do you pre-train it together with the, the initial model or you have to initialize new weights for that? So, so this creates some uh, challenges with optimization and training. Uh, and then the other question is that how can you scale this, right? Because uh, if you're going to like, like uh, half a million, of, I mean, like half a billion documents, right? Then how, how, how are you going to scale up? Because the model size becomes really huge. Uh, but, but, you know, for, for at least for this paper, we only consider, um, you know, up to 300K docs. Uh, and, and in our experiments, we try up to a million documents. Uh, so, so this is still, you know, for now, it's still, still, still uh, you know, we still can compute this. Uh, but but, but this, this direction will, will face scale, scaling issues later. But, but as for now, we're just trying to investigate like which, uh, uh, which which method uh, has more promise? So, the last one, the last way of uh, representing um, dog IDs, we we actually investigate this method of uh, you know uh, imbuing the model with some kind of uh, inductive bias that is is from the entire global corpus information. So, uh, this is like a more fancy way to 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 assign dog IDs. So basically. The idea is quite simple. Uh, what we do is that basically we, we just apply hierarchical clustering on some pre-trained uh, bird representations, uh, document representations, and then you just continuously hierarchically cluster them. And then you assign, uh, like at the first stage, you assign, uh, you know, you, you create 10 clusters and then you assign zero to nine, uh, 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 zero to nine to, to, to different clusters and then you you know you hierarchically go down uh, this this document cluster so basically the model like you know is predicting uh, uh, down a path of you know hierarchical clusters so we, we use beam search to to, um, to 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 generate this document cluster so this is basically the third uh, method that we try to 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 represent these dog IDs so the next um, the next question, right? So we have talked about how we represent the doc IDs in DSI. Um, the next question is how to represent document tokens. So uh, on the targets, you have doc IDs and on the inputs, you have the doc tokens. And then the question is that, you know, what's the best way to represent these document tokens? Because documents can be long, right? 
So uh, we explore three different uh, methods. So the first is actually like direct indexing. So we just take the document and it is and you map, map it to uh, document tokens. Um, and then uh, it may be the doc ID, I mean. And then the second method we, we, we try is actually set indexing. So this is uh, permutation invariant, like it doesn't matter order. We basically just remove stop words, remove duplicated words, and then we use that as a document uh, 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 token. And then the last one is that we take sliding window. So, so one doc ID can be associated to multiple chunks of the same document. And then, uh, so, you know, uh, throughout the training, it takes turns to associate uh, document IDs to different parts of the document. So there, there are also like, you know, we also explore different options of how to represent the indexing task, uh, how to train the, uh, the, the, in the indexing task. So th these are all SIG to SIG tasks. And then, uh, so basically, you know, the first, uh, first, the first, the first variation, variation, which is the one I described earlier, is basically mapping doc tokens to doc IDs. So this is just inputs to targets, doc to doc IDs. And then this, we also tried other variants just to make sure that we cover all the grounds. Um, so, uh, for example, we, we try to do the reverse, right? So you you have uh, you have doc ID and then you try to predict the doc tokens, and then we try a bidirectional uh, 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 way of of indexing, which we we did both um, uh, doc to doc ID and then doc ID to doc token. So we do like both ways. And then finally, the last one we do the, the typical T5 span corruption uh, uh, pre-training. It's very similar to mass language modeling, but uh, but we you know so we just concatenate document IDs to the uh, to, to to the documents, and then we do span corruption. So there's some some percentage of the the mass uh, tokens are actually uh, the dot IDs. So so we hope that you know by reconstructing these dot IDs in uh, in the targets, the, the model does learn something. Uh, so the research question here is basically what is the best uh, indexing task option here to learn this, this, this association. So a spoiler alert is that it turns out that the doc tokens to doc IDs are the best. I mean, the second option, the doc ID to doc tokens, like um, they actually don't work at all. You get 0% on retrieval. Bidirectional works, but it doesn't improve upon the first option. And then spam corruption, like uh, it, it doesn't work at all. It's like 0% on retrieval. So the it, for, for the span corruption is also probably because the model doesn't like we, we are relying on 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 this random chance of masking to to allow the model to learn this association. So it might not be sufficient, but uh yeah. So for now is that the, the it's actually the, the most simple one, uh the doc tokens to doc IDs that, that perform the best. So uh so these, these are the indexing task options that uh that we tried. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how is this DSI model uh, trained and optimized. So the main model uh, is a you know a encoder decoder transformer initialized with the T5 model. So basically we use the pre-trained T5 checkpoints, and then indexing and retrieval is optimized together with multitask learning. So they are co-trained together, and then uh, we we explore a couple of you know many different things uh, to get this to work. So we, we intuitively we try to index first for k steps, and then we learn retrieval after that. So you, you train the model first on indexing. You try to memorize the corpus first, and then you train the model on on the retrieval task next. Um, so this this did worse actually. So uh, you know if, if you separate out like you do a sequentially sequential uh, multitask learning, it, it, it does worse. So uh, and then we also find that the interplay is tricky. So if you index the ratio of indexing and retrieval is 50-50, it does significantly worse than setting the indexing task to like two times or three times or even like eight times more of the retrieval task. So it turns out that, that this, this ratio, which, which I will share more ablation studies later, uh, is, very, uh, is, is very important for the performance. So uh, it also seems that you know, the optimization is tricky uh, and then getting this uh, interplay correct is, is quite important for for good performance, because if you set the multitask ratio correctly, you can even do x or three x the the performance of, of of the model on retrieval. So, uh, yeah. So so this this was quite a quite quite a hard model to train in general. Uh, but if you get it right, then it can fly. So I'm going to share a bit more about some experiments. Uh, so this is basically uh, proof of uh, inciting proof of concept. We we basically uh. 
present results on natural questions. Uh, it's basically a set of 300K, um, 307K QA pairs. And then uh, each QA pair, um, you know, comes with the corresponding Wikipedia article uh, or document. Um, and then we construct three subsets from MQ uh, to also understand how corpus size affects the DSI. So we select, we, we just use 10K document, 100K, and then the full 307K uh, documents. Uh, so uh, after the paper was out, we, we got a lot of questions about, you know, uh, how is this, you know, training split, you know, done and, and, and everything. So to, 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 to be clear here, the, the model actually sees the entire document set uh, during training, because it has to, right? Because it, it has to know the doc IDs of the stuff, even with the validation set. Uh, but but the, the thing is that the model doesn't see the Korean document pairs in the, in the validation set. So, um, so, so we, we assume that the model sees all the documents, like all the documents are already readily available to the model. Uh, it's just that you don't know the query document associations uh, for those in the validation and test set. So we tried a couple of baselines uh, and then we, we use the, 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 the most standard baseline, the BM25, uh, which is uh, unsupervised baseline. Uh, and then we use T5 to do encoders. So basically this is a dual encoder model uh, that, that uh, uses the T5 encoder. Uh, so this is for the fairest comparison because uh, our model, DSM model, uh, is, is the starting point is the T5 model. So we also want to you know, keep the base model like as similar as possible to, to really compare and ablate uh, across the different uh, model paradigms. And then uh, this is trained with uh, constructive learning using T5X framework. Um, and then uh, so, so we basically uh, use the same infrastructure as the sentence T5 paper. Uh, uh, who is also they are, they are also co-authors of this paper, and then um, and then so um, then the documents are, are retrieved with, with uh, a, a fast inner product search server, and then for zero shot uh, unsupervised. So uh, we also got a lot of questions about what the zero shot mean here. So it basically means that uh, the model does not see any Korean document pair uh, or any of this label data. So the the most representative baseline for for zero shot is uh, probably BM twenty five which a lot of people compare with uh, on unsupervised information retrieval. And then we also compare with uh, raw T5 embedding. So uh, uh, here raw means basically means that we don't uh, do any like similarity based pre-training on this uh, T5 embeddings. We just take the, the, the T5 embeddings that, 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 that are, are from, uh, I mean, from the pre-trained model, we don't do anything on top of it. And then we compute similarity based on that. Uh, obviously this, this, this is not, this does not do well because uh, the model has not like have not learned notion of similarity, and then we use uh, we also compare with sentence T five, uh, which is also uh, considered the SOTA for unsupervised uh, sentence similarity learning. Um, so so these are the, the suite of baselines that we use and compare uh, in our experiment. So um, I'm going to walk through quickly about the results here on these three um, subsets of NQ. So uh, the main thing that we are updating here is actually the method of uh, represent dot IDs because we find that that's the most sensitive. To, I mean, it affects the performance the most. Uh, and then for most of these uh, models, we actually uh, evaluated models from a base model about 200 to 250 million parameters to uh, 11B parameters. Uh, for the T5 XSL, and then we uh, basically we we try uh, atomic dog IDs, uh, naive string dog IDs, and semantic string uh, string dog IDs. Uh, so I mean it might be confusing now, but let me just do a quick recap about what this means, right? So uh, the naive string dog IDs is that you represent a dog ID with just random strings. Uh, you just assign them randomly, uh, and then uh, you try to predict that, uh, memorize that. For atomic dot IDs, it's also randomly assigned, uh, but we treat each uh, uh, dot ID token as, as a, a, a like an atomic unit uh, that, that cannot be break apart by any tokenizer. Uh, and we assign uh, an embedding budget to every atomic dot ID such that uh, uh, you know the, the model is actually doing a soft softmax output, uh, learns a distribution over the dot IDs. So this is the atomic dot ID method. And then finally, for the semantic string doc ID, is basically 
uh, Vim search down uh, hierarchical clustering. So we assign dot IDs based on uh, uh, the results from from a, from a clustering method. And so the model is basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, zero to from zero to nine is learning like which which of the first ten cluster it belongs to, and then within each it expands out further into another ten clusters, uh, assuming a zero to nine uh, uh, integer, uh, you know, labeling scheme. Uh, so basically, the the we we evaluate on two simple uh, retrieval based metrics, which is the heat set. One and it hits at ten uh, for for these three uh, data sets. So we, we, overall, we, we find that the, the results are actually quite interesting because the first thing is that the knife string out ID actually does reasonably well, uh, and oftentimes it outperforms atomic uh, dog IDs. Even though atomic dog IDs are given more budget for every uh, document, uh, we also find that atomic dog IDs are generally hard to train uh, because if you see uh, on the last. Uh, the second last column, you see uh, the DSI large. Uh, we had troubles optimizing the model, and it, it just got six point nine. No matter how hard we try, so so there's there's some optimization issues that make the atomic dot IDs hard to train. They also converge slower uh, because I, I I mean there there are new parameters being introduced, and and there's some extra uh, you know uh, difficulties there. But when you just uh, uh, allow the model to memorize random uh, string dot IDs, the, the model just does that. Pretty well, uh, and then finally we see that that when you actually you know give some inductive bias to the to the dog IDs uh, by by cl clustering, you, you you look at the last uh, the last data set, the, the NQ three twenty uh, on the last columns uh, at the last rows, you, you see that this greatly improves over the live string of dog IDs. So so this global clustering does help uh, the model learn, and we also find that this optimizes this converges way faster than. Using nice string dot IDs, but but this is intuitive, right? Because, uh, you know, like if 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 there's structure there, the model just learns it faster rather than having to memorize random things. So the next thing we tried is actually zero shot retrieval. Uh, the question is that how well can our model do without uh things supervised data? So, basically, in the context of DSI, all we do is that we 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 perform the indexing task, but we don't fit our model any query document pair. So the model just learns to map uh, document to doc ID. And then the model is not trained on uh, retrieval at all. So uh, we, we, we use the same data sets again. And then if you notice the BM25 results are the same because uh, BM25 is unsupervised. So, so it's the same results. Um, and then we, we just compare the, also compare the three um, doc, uh, doc ID representation methods in, 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 in the in, in this experiment. Um, so uh, the interesting thing here is that you, you notice that actually the atomic dot IDs here uh, do the best, uh, although they are the slowest. Uh, the naive dot IDs uh, does the worst because it, it's very hard to allow like for the model to just you know decode token by token, but it, it has not seen uh, the, 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 the query dot pairs at all. And then the somatic string dot IDs like improve upon the knife string dot IDs, but generally uh, on NQ 100K and NQ 320K, it still loses to uh, atomic dot IDs. So the, the other thing to note is that uh, DSI with atomic dot IDs can outperform sentence T5 on, uh, on, on zero shot retrieval, and it also outperforms BM25. Uh, and as also I mentioned that the T5 raw embeddings, they, they do horribly, so, so they, they probably don't learn anything useful for for retrieval at all. So, uh, but center C5 serves as a strong baseline uh, for, for uh, zero shot retrieval. Uh, so, so we, are, we are actually quite uh, excited by this, uh, um, you know, this, this, um, this result. Uh, so it seems that, you know, like just trying to map document tokens to dot IDs, uh, you know, as, as it just, uh, you know, it's pretty decent as a representation learning method, like to, to learn, uh, to be able to do zero shot retrieval. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on the effect of indexing strategy. So uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, this now, but just to recap, because this is like probably the ablations that we also present in the paper. So uh, the dot to dot IDs indexing strategies works the best. Uh, the bidirectional one where we do dot to dot ID and then we also co-train with dot ID and mapping to document tokens, it works okay, uh, but not better. Uh, so it's, it's, it's comparable, but it's, it, we, we didn't see any 
big gains. So we, we just stopped doing the, the, the reverse altogether. Uh, and then you, if you do the reverse alone, you get 0% retrieval. So the model doesn't learn anything at all. It does not work at all. Uh, it could be also we did not try high enough, but at least in this current setup, like, it doesn't work at all. Um, so the span corruption, uh, infusing the IDs into span corruption, uh, as in the T5 style span corruption, uh, does not work at all. It is 0% uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, so uh, I mean, my explanation of this is that we are relying too much on random chance to mask out the dog ID. So, so it does not learn enough uh, to, to memorize um, enough information. Um, though a, a, a probably a, a fo a interesting follow-up work is that we actually plan to really pre-train this model from scratch uh, to, to see whether like if you give, give given enough pre-training, this actually does, does work well. So the, the TLDR here is that uh, the design of the indexing task is uh, is crucial, uh, but like simple, the, the simple one works the best. So the first thing that we try is actually dot to dot ID, and then that works already. And then we, we continue to investigate more and everything, and then seems like nothing beats the first thing that we tried. So that was interesting as well. Um, so this time I, I talked about the effect of uh, the document representation. Um, so. The, 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 it's also interesting that the, the simplest one works the best here. Uh, the direct indexing works the best. Uh, so, you know, going to high sequence lengths uh, is also hurt performance because I, I you know, we, we hypothesize is because it's harder to memorize the association with the doc tokens and the doc IDs. So, staying at the first 32 or first 64 tokens does seem like the best. Uh, and it also might be, might be also related to the data set because uh, you know, sometimes the answer may be found very early in the document. So, so it depends, it's very data set dependent. Uh, we, 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 we are not exactly sure if this, this finding uh, would hold for other data sets because like, you know, sometimes the, the, the correct answer may be in the lie at the end of the document. Uh, so the interesting thing here though is that the set index where you remove uh, stop words and we remove uh, order, uh, it, it does not help the performance. It, it, it's not, it does reasonably well, uh, but it's not like it does not beat the, the other other methods. Uh, so finally, the, the last one, the, inver the inverted index, which is basically uh, you know we are associating different parts of the document to the to dog ID. That that does not uh, uh, that that works like the worst. Uh, uh, there there might be also issues with that because the, the model is confused because every time it sees the dog ID, it's a different part of the document and then maybe there's not enough capacity to memorize that. So, so this, this, is, this is still, you know, like a unsolved problem, right? Because intuitively it seems like the inverted index would, would, would probably work the best, but, uh, but maybe it's an issue of capacity. Maybe we need to train the model longer. Maybe we need a larger model um, and everything. So, so this is interesting stuff that, that we still hope to explore further. And then finally we compute scaling loss for, for, this, uh, for, for this model. So we are mainly interested uh, to see whether DSI scales differently from dual encoders. So the red line is basically, uh, this is log scale uh, graph. So you can see that, that uh, the, the DSI actually scales, uh, there's, there's a slightly better scaling behavior compared to dual encoders. Because dual encoders, um, they, they don't, like they seem to not scale, like, like going to XXL, uh, from XL to XXL, they don't really seem to, to, to help much. Uh, but like for DSI, like the base model generally, that doesn't do that well, but like when you go to XL and XXL, like the model capacity uh, really helps. So, so there's actually promise here, like we feel that, that uh, as we go to larger models, like eventually you reach a point where, where, uh, where, where, where DSI is just strictly better than dual encoders. We are not sure uh, what happens after 11B uh, and we are, we are probably also interested to try that, uh, but, but at least for dual encoders, we see that, uh, you know, going uh, to larger representations do not seem to help much uh, in terms of uh, performance. So, uh, yeah, so I, I come to the, to the end of the talk. Um, so basically the, the, the overall conclusion is that we, we present like a new paradigm for retrieval. Uh, you know, we, we rethink the, the traditional IR retrieval uh, paradigm of dual encoders, and then uh, we try to frame retrieval as generation. Uh, so this has multiple advantages, uh, you know, the, the, to, to recap, um, you know, all aspects of search are now mapped to well-known ML problems. So there's no more discrete uh, maximum inner product search. And then it's easy to unify uh, with other NLP applications. Uh, so if you want like a, 
you know, maybe a re re retrieval augmented model, you, you do not need to spin out for a retrieval server. You can just do that in the same model. Uh, these are, you know, interesting things that we, we also want to try. Uh, and then, the, you, you, you know, uh, it's also easy to unify because now you can uh, easily, uh, you know, in, in the past, if you want to do like NLU together with like ranking your, your, your evals for ranking is always going to be a little bit more troublesome uh, because of the, you have to compute all the pairs. Uh, but but now it may be you know more convenient to to, event, to unify with other NLP uh, applications within the same model, uh, and then you know like we're also interested in you know like uh, if you can encode uh, you know examples or, or, or documents into into the, the transformer and then you can retrieve them then you know there, there might be more some promise in you know like like retrieving prompts uh, from your, your yourself like it's like you know self prompt tuning to to kind of also. Uh, augment like like NLP applications. So uh, I think these are the main like in my opinion like this is are the main uh, you know advantages of DSI and uh, we are also more interested like from a machine learning perspective more than a retrieval perspective of like the memory capacity and, and you know like in the future do we go to sparse models do we uh, you know like what about like semi-parametric models and stuff like that. So uh, I think there's a lot of interesting research uh, more, more to go. Uh, for now we are still using a dense Transformer model and everything is encoded in the model, but I think in the future we might see uh, some of these like you know like external memory and, and stuff like that. So so uh, I think this is yeah. So I just you know come to the end of uh, the presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's hard to stop me to the mask. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Uh, so let's. Uh, uh, Again, thanks for uh, you to give uh, the talk. So uh, now we will have uh, a question answering session. Uh, as earlier, um, we circulated a, a Padlet link. So uh, you can go to that Padlet link. Let me just uh, try to get it out of the way, um, which is over here on the, the Zoom chat. If you're in the audience, you can scan the QR code to ask, OK? Um, and there are already questions on the Padlet. So um, let me just read out a couple of, of them to you. I'll just uh, bring this up a little bit. Uh, so there was one question early. What are your thoughts on a knowledge-based retrieval system using an encoder decoder architecture versus using just the one or the other? So this is, this is... Yeah, the, the first question. So, okay, so I guess, uh, yeah. The question is basically like I, I'm going to answer this like uh, in the context of encoder decoder versus encoder only and decoder only models. So uh, technically, decoder only models uh, uh, and when you use it in like a prefix language model style, is actually very similar to uh, encoder decoder. So anything you can do with an encoder decoder, you can also do with a decoder only model. Uh, so there are there are some advantages of encoder decoder and why uh, why it might be preferred, right? So, um, so this 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 so a, a encoder decoder model with like uh, L by L layers is actually the same speed as a decoder model decoder only model with two L layers because in the end the inputs and targets still have to be uh, you know processed uh, and decoder only uh, prefix LM models actually concatenates uh, inputs and targets uh, to uh, you know to, to to do most tasks. So technically, encoder decoder models are kind of a uh, form of sparsity. They are, they are also like sequentially sparse uh, because you kind of have dedicated parameters to inputs and targets. So uh, encoder decoder models are, are to some extent uh, also, uh, you know, you have different uh, parameters for the inputs and targets. So there's some advantage there uh, because the, the flop to uh, the parameter to flop ratio behaves differently from decoder only models. So this is from a uh, efficiency point of view uh, uh, between decoder only models and encoder decoder models. So encoder only models like like BERT, they are actually not much different also from uh, decoder only models. If you read the T5 paper closely on the section where they compare uh, model architectures, you find that encoder only models and decoder only models, uh, if you process the entire input and then you enable a bidirectional uh, input field on the decoder only model, uh, which is the prefix LM model is actually quite similar to, to a BERT uh, encoder uh, because you, you are 
uh, you're, you're putting one token uh, at, at the decoding stage uh, for classification tasks. So that's for encoder only uh, versus decoder only architecture. Uh, and then for knowledge based retrieval system, uh, I, I, I don't really know exactly like what, like what application, uh, is this like knowledge graph completion or is this like, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure like exactly what uh, application is this, but generally I, I, I try to comment um, mainly on echo decoder versus decoder only. Um, yeah, but, but my, my, I, I, I like encoder decoder more the, the, the most, I think, because of the flop to, 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 to parameter uh, ratio. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, I think that partially addresses that question. Let's take a look at a couple other questions and then uh, we can just pick a couple uh, that you want to answer. So um, there's one over here on generalizing in encoding new documents. So uh, the question is, you know, does the proposed document to doc ID mapper have to be retrained, uh, you know, when, when provided with new documents? Because of course there are new documents coming in a, a document uh, server all the time. Yeah, so, sounds good. This is actually a great question. Uh, we, 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 have, we have already been thinking about this and it, is, it comes up a lot. So <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, so there are multiple things that we think that, uh, you know, are, 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 can, be, can, be, can, be, can be done here. So the first thing that we can do is that you can have, uh, you know, you can have multiple decoders uh, and then you can, you know, have a, each decoder handle, like say like 50K documents. And then when you have a batch of new documents, you just, uh, you know, uh, relearn the indexing task by, by swapping a new decoder. And, and doing inference, you can use an MOE like architecture to route across the different decoders. So this is one, uh, one possible uh, uh, a way of handling new documents. And the other way is to, like if you have a new document, you can pass it through the indexing task to get a doc ID. And then you just assume that this new document and the, the, the document that already exists in the index uh, is the same document that we, I think some some extent of clashes in the doc ID space is actually uh, uh, okay, uh, and then we can use that to approximate when there's new documents. So so these are these are two um, uh, uh, methods. Uh, I believe the 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 latter is actually uh, I I I mean we don't have empirical evidence of this, but uh, I I think it will work like pretty pretty uh, well off the box. Okay, maybe we skip back. So uh, again, if you have questions, uh, please go to uh, the Padlet. Um, there's a, a chat link for uh, the one on the left, which is uh, these talks. Um, so let me skip back for a second and, and take a look at uh, one of the questions asked earlier. Um, oh, I didn't know there were so many. Um, can you give us more details about how your semantic string ID works? Because uh, I think it was presented a little fast. Is it uh, building on your zero to nine example, is it something like uh, Dewey Decimal where you you cut the, uh, do clustering, let's say 10 times and then uh, reduce it uh, every time? Yep, so so the, the, the it's, it's actually a simple uh, idea. So you do hierarchical clustering uh, and then like we, after we assign like we create 10 clusters, we assign zero to nine. And then among the, 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 the cluster, we cluster it again and then assign it zero to nine. So that's like the sequential representation of the, 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 the final string. So it's actually like not that complicated. It's, it's, it's still simple uh, for now. So yeah, this, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's uses a zero to nine uh, uh, scheme and then creates 10 clusters and then creates another 10 clusters and create another 10 clusters. Uh, there's some special things done to you know, handle like, because uh, in the end you may some have some ties uh, with some scores and stuff. Like th there's some details about how, how, uh, how, how we handle the ties. And like, you know, like at the end of the day, we have some tie breakers stuff in the end. So that, 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 but other than that, it's pretty much quite, quite, quite a simple uh, algorithm. Okay. Uh, see whether there's any other messages in chat. Uh, yeah, just just me. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe we ask uh, one more about computational complexity. So um, what's the inference complexity of uh, your document uh, DSI system versus the uh, MIP space retrieval systems? Because you, you uh -huh. were talking about complexity as well. Yeah, so this is also a good question, but I think there's a lot of like, factors that affect right 
like what's actually the like, and then at the end of the day like whether complexity is actually an accurate representation of like like the actual throughput and actual latency of the system uh but generally uh it also depends on whether the documents are pre cache or like in in the mip space retrieval whether uh you know you, you have to do you consider the encoding of documents into the cost is it a one off uh, overhead cost uh but generally that there's like we, we actually wanted to put a section on this in the paper but it was very hard to really nail down uh uh you know what counts as complexity of mips based retrieval and what counts under complexity of the transformer because do you consider the indexing task as part of the complexity and then how do you consider that right because the number of training steps and like is it like flops times number of training steps so i don't think there's a like very good answer to this but in terms of actual uh you know uh assuming the best case for both if your mid space retrieval is like your documents are pre-encoded and stuff uh is is the difference between like uh, uh the, the mips and and basically one like for for the transformer side is actually one decoding uh, uh uh or at least n decoding step depending on which dot id representation so uh so so it's, it's hard to tell uh but yeah i, I think the, the best answer is that it's, it's hard to tell depending on the application and and infrastructure yeah okay i think we have time for one more question and then we should let our speaker take a break so we'll ask the last question uh that just came up uh more parameters or more computation we can see amazing scaling performance, but uh, which one should be more important for DSI, your framework? Uh, should we prioritize computation or shall we use uh, MOE here? So, so computation, okay, so uh, I think MOE and sparse models are definitely going to, 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 to help. So. Uh, I, I, this is also not re probably related to, to DSI specifically, but in general, like uh, for, for you know, just generally, uh, but uh, I think there have been like enough evidence recently that sparse models like uh, like GLAM or, or Switch Transformer, they, they actually uh, work very well uh, for NLP applications. So generally, I believe DSI is not going to be much different from that. Uh, I think having uh, a, a very unique, uh, I mean, having a sparse parameter to flop ratio is advantageous. Uh, I mean, not only for DSI, but generally as well. Uh, and then, on the, like, additionally, it might actually benefit DSI more because uh, DSI has this memorizing component where, where, where parameter, like having, like, like there's the additional advantage of going to, to sparse models where having like a, a, you know, a good parameter to flop ratio is advantageous. So, um, I think the answer is that the answer here is that I think the TLDR is that sparse models will work better. We have not tried that, but but we are, we are excited to see what happens. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's put our hands together again uh, for all of you online as well. Thanks, Steve, for the talk. Uh, so you told us that your slides are uh, we can distribute later. Is that right? Or uh, Oh uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. um, you know, pending uh, any other clearance, uh, we'll be able to give the slides out uh, uh, to the audience. Um, we're going to take about a, a five-minute break, okay? And we're going to come back at uh, twelve o'clock for Tang's talk on a noisy student model. So, uh, please stay tuned. If you're in the LT, if you need to go to the restrooms, they're outside to your right, uh, and then you can go like fifty meters, and there's a restroom there. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.